Welcome back. You're watching Daybreak. Many thanks indeed for staying with us as we continue talking about safety and security. With the reopening of uh, the uh, Dusit Hotel at the 14 Riverside Complex yesterday, and of course today they opened their doors for business yesterday, it was sort of like a soft launch. Um, you know, we're asking ourselves this morning, what were the lessons from that 14 Riverside Drive attack? Uh, the Daily Nation have termed it as triumphant. Dusit reopens after terror attack, ETC. But we're asking ourselves, what have Kenyans learned uh, moving forward in regards to what happened in January this year? Tabitha, let me start with you. In your view, biggest lessons from that uh, Riverside Complex attack uh, for Kenya? For Kenya. That we should have learned? Uh, one, that we cannot afford to be less vigilant than we've been. Maybe if this attack had happened in December, the outcome would have been different because in December we sort of expect something to happen. So when it happens there's, there's after December, security. then we're like, oh, we're done with December. It's never that serious. We can now go back to work. And we were all tired from the holiday. So uh, we need to keep being alert. We need to continue training people about terrorism. We need to understand that terrorism has no religion. And so you don't expect it to always come from a religious perspective. And so we need to know that when these groups are using politics to, to achieve what they want, then it has nothing to do with religion. Uh, something else that we learned was that our country has become stronger than it was in the past. We saw how the emergencies, um, emergency medical services were deployed to the scene, how our law enforcement went fast, uh, how even the media reported it, because there was a very big difference between how this attack was, was reported and the others in the past have been reported. So I think we've learned quite a lot. Uh, and for me, the reopening of uh, Dusit Hotel after six months, I think is a big, big plus because we've seen hotels and institutions that took way longer to uh, how much get long, back how on much their longer? feet. So, for instance, in 2008, when the Mumbai attacks happened, the Taj Mahal Hotel took two years to uh, to to reopen mm -hmm. and get itself back in business. And that's a lot of revenue that's lost. Uh, there's people that, you know, along the way lose their jobs. And Trevor just told us that all the employees are back, looking forward to working with the hotel. So, and if, if you look also at the attacks in France in 2015, the concert hall where the, I think the Eagles were performing? The yes, Eagles? I, th I think yeah. I remember that It incident. took over a year for them to, uh, get back and reopen and for Sting to go and have a concert there. So it takes a long time. Um, World uh, Trade Center took more than nine months to just clear the, the debris that, you mm -hmm. know, came from that building with more than 50,000 people working almost every day to clean up that place. And so I think we're doing well in terms of building our resilience and showing that we're strong and we're not going to let this thing take over. Dr. Mugo, you were telling us um, off the camera that this Dusit D2 attack was a blessing in disguise for Kenya. How so? Yes, it was a blessing in disguise, uh, despite the loss. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry for the victims. Uh, we realized that we are now involved as Kenyans in planning mm -hmm. and executing terror attacks. Mm -hmm. Before that, we, most of us thought uh, terror attacks are done uh, or carried out by foreigners, mm -hmm. people from uh, neighboring countries, people from other religions. But now we saw people bearing names from uh, uh, which we can easily identify with. And this is a wake-up call for Kenyans to be more vigilant, be more alert, build resilience, and also learn how to disrupt activities of terrorists mm -hmm. and violent extremists. Mm -hmm. So that we are able, if we disrupt <coughs> the planning, or <coughs> disrupt the execution, like in Ducid D2, the, by a grace of God, there was a disruption in the execution of the, of the attack. Whether by stroke of luck, there were some GSUs behind the attackers, there were some, uh, the security officers were able to open the, hide do the, the doors behind and people left. And, uh, but what we need to do as Kenyans is first, reduce the pool of of those who could be radicalized like uh, so preemptive preventive measures preventive measures we, be looking at as we look at because uh, to prevent a terror attack is like now they're not they, even if you put uh you still or install the highest level of security at ducid d2 riverside drive they're never going to come back there they never went back to the american embassy they're not going back to westgate they look for another vulnerable uh, site where we are not thinking where we are not aware so we should be 
you know, constantly upping our security, ETC. Yes, and I would say this from the DUCID D2 that uh, the security apparatus up their game compared to, say, Westgate. We, we saw better coordination. There was uh, a line of command uh, that was followed. There was a coordination uh, on emergency activities and a bit of coordination of the media compared to... to Tell me what, you, what you th your thoughts about the media. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've the said that's your media uh, is topic as well. Media, media, media... Uh, uh, is the best uh, uh, preventive uh, tool for terror attacks because you're able to disperse information mm -hmm. immediate. Like now what we are talking about, many people are listening mm -hmm. and you're able to educate the people. On the other hand, media is the oxygen for terrorists. Yeah. Mm. If you remove the oxygen, they're dead. They need media to broadcast the magnitude of the terror attack. So Dr. Mugo, how would you advise we as media, as the fourth estate, go about um, giving them blackout for the whatever activities they are performing, mm. but also doing right by society by letting them know what is happening? The society have the right to information. The media has to do their job. You cannot give them a total blackout. You have to inform mm -hmm. that there is an attack. It's, it's a very delicate balance. Because the moment there's an attack, you hear there's somebody claiming responsibility. And they say, this is Al-Qaeda, this is uh, Al-Shabaab. International media outlets. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And they will post a tweet on Twitter. Someone is ready. The, the moment the attack is taking place, somebody is ready on Twitter saying, we are responsible. Why? They want glory from that responsibility. Right. So how do we, we have to balance how to cut this guy from gaining uh, that glory from the death of other people. Tabitha, Dr. Mugo talked about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Let's just camp there for just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why is it, what is it about Kenya that makes us so vulnerable to terrorist attacks? Uh, one, our location. We're right next to Somalia, which has been unstable for more than 20 years now. Uh, we have borders that are very porous, so we have people coming in, going out. We have people bringing in things into the country that should not be brought into the country. Um, of course, there's a culture of corruption where you will turn a blind eye as a law enforcement officer if you get something in return without really thinking about the implications of that on other people. Uh, we have issues such as Kenya being as powerful as it is in the region becomes a very good target because if you target the strongest, then you look like you're strong. Mm -hmm. It's like in school when you're fighting the bully and you're the tiniest kid and it's quite a big deal as opposed to when you attack just like a small key that no one will pay attention so to. So how does corruption fit into terrorism? Uh, one, corruption brings about, um, I wouldn't use the word marginalization, but it brings about inequality in terms of people not being able to get access to social services, things like education, healthcare, good road networks and what have you. And so these people lag behind in terms of development. Right. And so the challenges that they go through make it difficult for them to compete with other Kenyans in other counties. And so now with the devolved government system, then these counties that had been lagging behind, they have an opportunity to now build themselves up so that they're going to be developed enough to provide these services to their people. But what corruption does is it robs the common man of the opportunity to get access to social services that improve their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, I want to let our viewers know that you can send your messages, whether of, of support to the businesses that are reopening at 14 Riverside Drive, whether Ducit or many of the other businesses that chose to stay there and, and, and build up from there as well. And also your thoughts on what more can Kenya do to be secure. Today it's about safety and security. What tips, you know, you know we haven't talked about community policing yet. Uh, Nyumbakumi, etc. Mm -hmm. The role of the media. What are your thoughts on that? 2242 is the SMS line. Hashtag is daybreak. Dr. Mugo, before we come back to you, you also had some thoughts about the media. You said that's one of your favorite topics, media and its coverage of, of terrorism. Of we terrorism. saw what yeah. New York Times did, for example, and they were called out by Kenyans and by Kenyan media as well. Mm -hmm. What more can Kenyan media do to educate its citizens but not give terrorist undue coverage? Mm. Uh, one, uh, focus on the victims, not on the attackers to be very careful when doing live streaming and live reporting because in that process you might end up giving out intelligence or information that doesn't have to be in the public space at that time and that helps the enemies so for instance if an attack happens here and you're bringing your cameras and the tourist is watching then they know your every move they can see what's happening on the ground uh, something else is the media 
has a responsibility to educate people even as they inform people. So they need to use their platform to educate other Kenyans on what tourism is all about and they need to get proper training themselves so they can train other people. And then speaking of media and terrorism, is how we as media and we as society, how we respond to terrorism bias. He has given a perfect example of how New York Times covered terrorism in Kenya, or just how foreign media mm -hmm. covers terrorism on the African continent vis-a-vis -vis how they cover terrorism within their home. own places. Yeah. The classic example is um, how terrorism is covered in first world countries how they covered Ariana Grande's concert, which a lot of young people were attending that as well. The travel advisories that they slap on African countries that mm -hmm. are faced by one or two terrorist attacks. So is how we respond to terrorism as a society biased? Uh, yes, because um, the media is just a reflection of the people behind it. So the West wants to push for its agenda. Africa has been lagging behind in terms of having its own media to give its own stories and that is changing. Over the last few years we've seen African journalists calling out things in the West that would easily have been swept under the rug when it comes to reporting about Africa. I don't know, I think you guys saw that advert, uh, I can't remember which there was, there was a media house that was New looking York for Times journalists Bureau and the way Chief. they say it, they, they put the advert out there, people were like, this does not make sense. So mm. I think They were looking for African an explorer. Mm. No, there's not really a, someone to put across the forest of, of Congo. <laughs> and so forth, we all saw that. <laughs> so uh, it's very biased. And so as Africans, we have to push to get our stories hard by our own people. And we have to be so proud of our culture and where we come from such that whether they like it or not, they will have to see that these people cannot mm. be changed. Dr. Mugo, your thoughts? Because even those travel advisories then go to have a ripple effect on the economy. You know, first of all, in the, in the terrorist attacks, we are not the real targets. We are collaterals. If you look at the history of the Al-Qaeda and those movements, their targets was not us, it was the Western countries. And that's why Tabitha is giving a lot of examples in Europe and, uh, in Europe and maybe some in the US we became a collateral because they think uh, they need to amplify their, their, their actions. So in their reporting, they will suppress, the, the Western media will suppress their, uh, their the impact of the attacks. But in our case, they will amplify to show that uh, either we are, uh, they, they, there's, a, there's a word that I don't want to use that was used by Trump. Yes, no, don't something, use it. Something <laughs> called countries. We understand. Eh? Yeah, we and know which one you're saying. <laughs> and they, they want us to look like that. So it is our responsibility and our media mm -hmm. to reflect what we really want to be mm -hmm. and what the society needs to know that we are. So that we, we are not, when one, one tourist is abducted, we have hundreds of thousands of tourists who come to Kenya, mm -hmm. they are safe and they go and they want to come back again. Yes. But when one is abducted, then there's a tra travel advice mm -hmm. That is bias. That is bias. Yes. And and I, but, but I also need to let you know, sorry for interrupting you because we need to hand over to Trevor, that this time round, the international community did not issue travel advisories against yes. Kenya. So mm -hmm. there is something that's changing. That's good news uh, in regards to, uh, and it's very significant mm -hmm. that that did not happen because we've seen what's happened in the past. Let's quickly cross over to Trevor Mbidja, who's speaking to somebody else who was working at uh, that Fort Riverside complex when the attack happened back in January, Trevor? Well, you're absolutely right, Rahiga. And like you mentioned, now they say that the place is uh, almost like a monument. It's in a very well-known area because of that terror attack. And joining me now, the activities still continue at the Ducy D2 restaurant. Joining me now is Maureen Kemunto. She's the PR manager, LG. That's a building that is just a few blocks from here within the 14 Riverside. They reopened in just two weeks. Maureen, thank you for making time for us. And I hate to take you back to this, but where were you when the attack happened? Um, I was actually in the office. It was an afternoon, as I remember. I had walked into the office um, 15 minutes just before the attack happened. So I must say I was fortunate. And uh, my, uh, my office is just in the first block as you come in to do sit. Um, it's just, uh, so I just walked in and I was in the office just doing normal office work with my colleagues. What kind of an impact does it, has it had on the LG colleagues? What do they say right now after it has, it's been, uh, you opened within two weeks? What, imp what kind of impact, what kind of changes have you seen in your colleagues? Uh, first of all, I must say we're unfortunate to lose a colleague. And uh, this had a real impact on the LG family. Uh, it actually brought us together. 
we felt that we needed to, we walked through this together no one should be left behind so we had a lot of support from management not only just locally as you know LG is a multinational company so we had lots of uh, support in terms of counseling um, uh, team peer support uh, so what this actually has made uh, the team come closer and uh, looking for out for one another how significant is this moment now that Ducit is reopening almost six, six months after the attack for you now and you're here and you know this is what happened? How significant is this moment right now? Uh, for me, this is actually exciting. When I walked through the doors of Ducit, I felt like, um, like, um, like life has, like it's a new beginning. Um, this is what we need to show that we are strong and life can carry on regardless. We know that... Uh, these things actually happen, but again, we don't stop there. Life has to carry on. When you look around, it looks like just six months before the attack. So it means that Ducit have actually gone ahead and done quite a lot to ensure that their customers and the neighborhood is just back to normal and uh, business has to run. And from the PR perspective, LG is still within the same block that it was in. And what what informed that choice? Because most people would say that a company would relocate rather than stay in the same area. For us as an organization, we actually felt that uh, this was a shake-up, but didn't mean that business has to stop. It didn't mean that we had to change the way we are doing business. It means we had to be re strategies and look for how we can um, protect ourselves. And in fact, what management has done has also put an extra effort to protect the premises. We now have um, bulletproof doors, and uh, we are still getting a lot of uh, trainings and uh, emailers just reminding us what you need to do in case of an attack. So for an organization, we really didn't feel that we had to move. All we needed to do is just to re-strategize and make sure that uh, employees are now informed because this can happen anywhere else. So this doesn't make you just move away because you just have to carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of employees, how much support do they get? Is there a counselor now inside? Is there therapy for some of them who are affected? How, how, what, how is LG handling that? Uh, at the beginning, especially the first two weeks when we came back, we had heavy and intense counselling sessions. Uh, we had group sessions, we had one-on-one -on -one sessions, and uh, this has been carrying on. And I feel that uh, employees are in a better place right now. Uh, we, we may not know if people are still having the sessions because it gets to a point where now it's a, an individual and a personal journey. But to be honest, when we sit down and we've done a lot of activities like team building, team sessions, so we feel that the team is actually together, put up, but uh, maybe one or two people could be still having the sessions, but uh, yes, there's still a lot of support towards the people to recover fully. Yeah. Yes. And how, how do you intend to take it forward in terms of uh, the collaboration between the employees and the unity? How do you ensure that that remains intact despite the history that now this place has? Uh, we have um, internally, we have actually introduced uh, what do I call exchange agents. So what this actually happens is to bring people like um, bring people closer to the top management because again you feel as an employee you're not able to approach management to say I'm still I'm still struggling. So what um, the organization has done, and I thank LG for this, is it has introduced what we call change agents, and this is basically a peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, mentor that helps employees come closer and express themselves freely and this feedback uh, openly gets to management so it, there's a lot of collaboration internally both top ones and uh, down, top, top down uh, in terms of uh, leadership and you're here this morning and you know it's a, it's the epitome of where the attack really happened what is what does that show from you is it a, a show of defiance or a show of courage for me it's actually a show of courage i um, just thinking that someone else would not be able to walk in here. I'll give you an example. I have one or two colleagues who still cannot pass outside the field where the terrorist blew himself. So for me being here, it's actually a sign of courage and to show that uh, um, we've had what we need in terms of help to be able to come in and walk in to do it. In fact, you can't really tell where the, if the, in the, you can't tell that this is the same place that the attack happened. Yeah. Thank you so much for making time this morning, Asante. And I'll let you get back to work because I know you're still working, Asante, for making time for us. And you see, that's what we're talking about here in this Ducit D2 reopening. The question really is, what goes on in the minds of the people who are in here? It's a show of defiance and a show of courage in the face of terror. And there's been a lot of renovation that has happened and several people are coming in here. Some of them would not even want to appear on camera. Tell me that they're here today. 
to show that they will not be cowed by terrorism. Well, with daybreak is taking a short break. We'll be back in just a bit.